lecture night. Here we are, and uh, we'll finish at nine o'clock. Um, all right, so the topic is King David in the Bavli. The uh, particular text I like to look at this evening, I don't think we'll finish it, is one that I find extraordinarily interesting, the way the Agada, which is in the Bavli, weaves together three different stories. And in weaving the stories together, it's saying something about the character of, of, of King David, David HaMelech. We can begin on the handout, as you see, on Sanhedrin, Sarihei, Ahmed Aleph, 95a. And the, the Gemara begins with a pasuk in Yeshayahu, quite a well-known pasuk, Od Hayom Benov Ramo. Od Hayom Benov Ramo, which is found at the end of chapter 10, is the first verse of a Haftorah that is read uh, outside the land of Israel on the last day of Pesach. It's a messianic prophecy. It's read on the last day of Pesach. In Israel, there is no eighth day of Passover, but they actually chose it to be read on Yom Atzmaut. Thinking of Yom Atzmaut, the founding of Israel and the resettling of Israel as a step in the messianic direction. So those who made that decision chose that to be read on Yom Atzmaut. Od Hayom Benov Ramon. Now it appears in Sanhedrin 95a, just to get a sense of the context in the Talmud and the context in the book of Yeshayahu. The context in the Talmud is that this, these Agadot that we've seen this week and now last week also we saw an Agadah from the last chapter of Sanhedrin is called Perik Chelek. And Perik Chelek talks about resurrection, talks about the world to come. It begins by saying that all of Israel has a portion in the world to come, but there are some exceptions. And the chapter deals with some of the exceptions. And the first Mishnah talks about there were three uh, kings who are exceptions, and there are four non-kings who are exceptions. That those, the choice of those people is itself very interesting. And then the very long, it's a very long chapter. It goes on to uh, discuss other possible exceptions to this general principle. Now, the because it talks about resurrection and the world to come and 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 the Mashiach. The Messiah is a central theme of this chapter. So in that context, it discusses King Chizkiyahu. King Chizkiyahu, uh, of course, when one studies the Bible, is a very important king. He is, uh, he tries to he initiate some, um, uh, some religious reforms uh, in Israel. And he uh, is also seen by the Talmud as a person who, uh, who is very into uh, the education of the people. In fact, the Talmud has a statement in the days of Chizkiyo, there was no man or woman, no boy or girl, it's interesting, boy or girl who didn't know all the laws of, of, of ritual purity and, and uh, impurity. It wasn't a single person, man, woman, child. So Chizkiyo was seen as very positive, even if perhaps a potential Messiah. And in the days of Chizkiyahu, there's a very important thing that happens in his time, which is in his time, Sancherev, the Assyrian, besieges Jerusalem with the intent of destroying Jerusalem, destroying the temple. And there is a miracle, and the troops of Sancherev die. They're killed in a plague. And that is the larger context of what we're going to begin to look at this evening, it's the destruction of the armies of Sanhedrin. And the same thing can be said for the book of Yeshayahu, that the, the verses and the chapters that precede cha the end of chapter 10 of Od Hayom Benog Ramod talks about Ashur, it talks about Assyria. It talks about the various conquests of the, of the Assyrians. And the Assyrians are then marching on Israel and they have various victories and they will be destroyed and are destroyed. I don't believe the name Sancher is explicitly mentioned there, but the Talmud understands it to be an allusion to that story. And 
the verse which begins to describe in these last verses God's might, God's power, um, it begins and the Haftorah begins and our text begins with the verse, verse 32 of chapter 10, Od hayom benov ramod. That very day, he will stop, he will stand in Nov. So the, the way the Talmud understands the story, and we'll see this, that Sancherev is marching towards Jerusalem, and he's gone to various different places before that. He seems to have subdued them. He's about to destroy Jerusalem, but before he comes to Jerusalem, he stops in the city of Nov. So let's look at the, the citation we have here. I'll read the English. What is the meaning of the phrase, this very day he will halt and know? Otayom benov ramot. So Rav Huna says, Otayom nishtayer me'avono shel nov. That very day, that was the final day that remained from the punishment that the Jewish people received from the sin of nov. Now, what is the sin of nov? So the sin of Nob is a reference to the story in Shmuel. The story is that when David is running away from Saul, Saul wants to kill David, jealous of David. And when David runs away from Saul, aided and abetted by Jonathan, the first place he runs to is the city of Nob. The city of Nob is a priestly city. It's a city of priests. The priests have who in the beginning of the book of Shmuel are the political force in the land, Ewi the high priest and his two sons, Chafin and Pinchas, are not just priests, but they're the powers that be. And the priests of Shiloh are, are killed. Shiloh is destroyed, never to uh, regain its prominence. And David runs away to Nob, which is also a priestly city, the head of whom is related to Ewi and to the family of Ewi. Now the priests of Ewi, priests of uh, Beit Ewi, are cursed in the beginning of the book of Shmuel. There's a curse on the house of Ewi. And this is the place that David runs to. And when David gets there, he asks the chief priest, who is Achimelech, he says, can you give me some food? Because I'm supposed to meet my men and we have no food. And the priest is very alarmed by this. He says to David, why are you alone? So, something's not right here. Why, he doesn't know of the, necessarily the rift, we don't know, of the rift between David and Saul. So David says, well, I'm on a secret mission and I'm gonna meet it with my troops. And it was a very pressing matter. So we are left without, without provisions. And the priest questions whether he can give David's men provisions. Because all we have here is, is sacred food, holy food, which requires a certain uh, care. You have to make sure you don't become ritually impure. Can I trust your people not to be impure? Certainly, says David, we're very careful. And he gives David the food. And then David says, by the way, I have no weapons either, because I was rushed away. Do you have any weapons in the priestly city of Nob? And the priest says, we have no weapons except one, the sword of Goliath. David says, that's fine, give me the sword of Goliath. Fine. Saul finds out that David has been in the city of Nov, and he is told by someone that the priest gave David provisions, he gave him a sword, and he inquired of God. The person who makes that claim in the book of Shmuel is none other than Doe, Doe Go Adomi who is described in the book of Shemuel as the chief shepherd of Saul. Doeg Ha'adomi, in the chapter of Sanhedrin, is one of those four people who has no share in the world to come. Doeg Ha'adomi. And the truth of the matter is that we don't know whether Doeg is simply lying or whether he actually believes that the priest did inquire of God for, for David. It's not clear when you read the story it's possible that he makes an honest error and thinks that, they, that the, the priest inquired for David. Now inquiring for somebody other than the king is very problematic because you inquire typically when you go to war. And given the fact that Saul is trying to kill David, 
and may presume that David wants to kill him, it's an act of treason to inquire of David from, from God, the priestly inquiry. So this Doeg says this to Saul. Now, how does Doeg know what, what happened? So Doeg knows what's, what happened because in that chapter in Shmuel, it says that when David was in the city of Nob, that Doeg was also there. Ne'etzar lifnei Hashem, bound up before God. We don't know why Doeg is in the city of priests, but it sounds like he's there in some kind of spiritual retreat. Ne'etzar lifnei Hashem. And when you study that story, which we're not going to do now, we don't have time for that, but it's interesting to note that the expressions that David uses about himself and the expressions that the text uses about Doeg or Adomi are very similar. Now, Doeg is the chief shepherd of Saul. David is a shepherd. Doeg is Adomi, he's an Edomite. David is Admoni. So right away, when you read the story, you get a sense that, that David and Doeg have something in common. From a literary standpoint, Doeg is perhaps Saul's, David's double. And what happens in the story is that when Saul hears about the priests, he, he commands his troops to, to kill the priests. But the priests refuse to do it. They're not going to kill. The, the soldiers of, of uh, Saul refuse to kill the priests. They're not going to murder the priests, who in fact are actually innocent. Because the priest did not inquire of David. And the priest says, I thought David was, he's your son-in-law, he's a trusted soldier. But Saul will hear none of this. And then Saul says to Doeg, okay, you're the one who testified against the priests. You killed the priests. And Doeg goes around and he kills all the priests. 85 priests he kills, except for one. There's one priest who runs away named Eviatar. And David meets up with him later. And David says to him, I'm going to protect you. So that's the story of Noah in the book of Shmuel. Um, but the Gemara in Sanhedrin doesn't start with the book of Shmuel. It starts with Od Hayom Benov Ramod. Sanherev, it says, halted in Nov. Why did he go to Nov? He intends to destroy Jerusalem. He intends to destroy the temple. One might say the priestly temple, but he stops in Nov. So Rav Huna says that day there still remained uh, something still remained from the punishment that the Jewish people deserved uh, from the story of Noah. And now the Agada tells us the following story. The astrologer said to Sanhera, if you go and conquer them now, you will overcome the Jewish people. If not, you will not overcome the Jewish people. So the Gemara says, he refers to Sanhereb, walked and traversed in one day a road upon which one must walk for 10 days in order to traverse it. It's another theme that we have elsewhere in Sanhedrin called Fitza Saderech. He, he travels there very quickly, like Jonah does in the book of Jonah. He gets there quickly. And when he gets there, they cast mats and pile them high. And he sits up above the wall. He sees the city of Jerusalem. When he sees it, it seems small in his eyes. He said, is this the city of Jerusalem for which I have disrupted all my camps and for which I have conquered all these countries? It's smaller and weaker than all the cities of the nations that I have conquered with my might. He shook his head in contempt. He waved, he waved, uh, he waved his hand. That's what it says in the verse, you know, faith you are dull. He waved his hands means dismissively at the Temple Mount. And the, the officer said to him, let's attack Jerusalem now. Sanhedrin said, no, no, tomorrow, let's, let's wait, let's wait tonight. Each of you bring me a piece of stone from the wall, equivalent to a seal, and I will breach the wall and vanquish the city. And the next verse says, referring to Sanhedrin, that that night, there was a uh, angel of God went to the camp of the Assyrians, and smote 185,000 men, the army of Sanherev. They were all corpses. Says Rav Papa, this is in accordance with the adage. 
when quarrel lies and is delayed overnight, the quarrel is nullified. It means that if you have something to do, do it right away and don't delay. Had Sancheirev acted immediately, perhaps Jerusalem would have been destroyed, but he waits. And because he waits, uh, his army is defeated. That's how this Agadita begins. So when you read the Agadita, you get the sense, of course, that Odayom Benov Ramo, the sin of Nov, was a sin committed by Saul, aided and abetted by Doeg Adomi, his shepherd, his chief shepherd, who turned out to be a, a, not just a shepherd, but also a killer. And uh, this, the stain of the sin, the destruction of the temple, actually, which, which, which King Saul uh, is, is central to the destruction of this priestly city, could be a precursor to the destruction of Jerusalem, which is the great priestly city. That is how this Agadita begins. But what's interesting is that suddenly the Talmud moves us to a different story. We're not talking about the Assyrians anymore and about Sancheirev and Chizkiyahu and all that, but rather the Gemara has discusses a different story. And this is a text that's found at the end of the book of Shmuel. The end of the book of Shmuel is a little epilogue to the end of the book of Shmuel that consists of six pieces, which are in chiastic order, A, B, C, C, B, A. And two of those six pieces refer to, one might say David's heroes or David's strong men. The first of which is found in chapter 21 of 2 Samuel, Shmuel Bet. And there's a story about several of David's great heroes who defeat the giant. That's the first story of David's Giborim. And that's the one that Gamaria will focus on. And then there's a second a list of David's great warriors, which is the end of chapter 23. So chapters 21, 22, 23, 24, over the course of these four chapters, there are six stories arranged A, B, C, C, B, A. Two of them are the uh, B, are the story of David's strongmen. And in particular, what interests the Gemara here is the first of the story of David's strongmen. So now it says the following. The translator says, apropos of the massacre of Nov, the Gemara relates. So this is a mention of, and here's what it says. It says, the Ishbi Benov, Ishbi Benov, one of the sons of the giants, the weight of whose spear was 300 shekels of brass. He was girded with new armor. He planned to slay David. This is taken from Shmuel Bet, chapter 21, the end piece of chapter 21. So he's called Ishbi Benov. That's the name of this person. Strange name, Ishbi Benov. Now, when you look at that section, which is the end of chapter 21, and you may have it actually elsewhere in your in the in the in these uh, sources, but over there there is a list of four giants that are slain by David's strongmen. What these four giants have in common is that they are all called all four powerful giants slain by David's strongmen are called Yuridei HaRafa. They were the children of the Rafa. The Rafa is a giant, giant woman. So this giant woman gives birth to four giants. And the first of whom is called Ishbi Benov. The others actually, giant two and three are something Begov. And this is Benov. So actually Benov stands out. There's Nov and there's Gov. So who is this Ishbi Benov? Strange name. Rabbi Yehuda says, in the name of Rav, this is the man, this is the man, the Ish, who came to punish David over matters of no. So right away, we're struck by this, came to punish David. This is not about Saul, it's about David. So Ishbi Benov, the story of Ishbi Benov, which is a 
very short story about David's, one of David's strong men, we'll get to this. And Ishmi Benob was going to punish David, that is to kill David, because of the sin of Nob. The Holy Blessed One said to David, until when will this sin be concealed in your hand without punishment? What is this? So the, 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 the Hebrew is actually higher up. I mean, from the English, the Hebrew is higher up. But how long do you think you're going to, how long can we not, how long can you not be punished for the sin of Noah? Through your actions, the inhabitants of Noah, the city of priests were massacred. Through your actions, Doeg the Edomite was banished from the world to come. And through your actions, Saul and his three sons were killed. Now let me just repeat what is obvious. The Talmud Bavli has a little interest in, in defending King David for the most part. This is a rather astonishing statement. Because when you read the story of Nov, you don't think of David at all. You think of Saul's decision paranoid decision to uh, to kill the priests. His own men won't do it. He turns to Doeg, who, who testified against them. And he tells Doeg, you're the one who testified against them. You're the one who should carry out the punishment. Actually, the Torah speaks of this when it talks of capital cases. The witnesses, the ones who testified, should carry out the execution. But here, the Talmud is blaming David. How long do you think you can get away with this? And you're guilty for three things. The death of the priest of Nov, the fact that Saul himself died, presumably as punishment for what Saul did, but you set it up by going to Nov. And not only that, Doeg the Edomite, banished from the world to come, I hold you responsible for that. So the first question actually is when you read these Agadot, is what is the Agada picking up in the story? Perhaps it's just making something up, or perhaps there's something, there's an act of interpretation over here. And my general belief is that, for the most part, there's always a kind of interpretive angle to what the Agadot is saying. In this case, actually, it's a very good interpretation. Because if you recall the story of Noah, when after the priests are all massacred by Saul, and one priest survives, who is Eviatar, who becomes David's priest for most of his life, until banished, after, until banished by his Shlomo, David says to Eviatar, I knew, I, was, I saw Doeg the Edomite here, and I knew he would tell Saul about my being here. Anochi Saboti says, I am the cause of, says David, I am the cause of the death of your family and therefore stay with me, I will protect you. So David himself, we are told, it's actually remarkable. It's one of the interesting features of the book of Shmuel, among many, that often at the end of the story, the, the book drops a, a bombshell that David actually knew that Doeg was there. We know he's there. Netzar Lefnei Hashem, bound up before God. We didn't know that David knows this until the very end of the story. And David says about himself, Anochi Saboti, I am the cause of the death of your family. And in fact, it's very interesting when you read the book of Shmuel, when uh, Saul instructs Doeg to kill the priests, Saul says, solve upagabo, circulate, solve, and, 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 and kill the priests. And it's exactly the same language that David used when David said, anochi saboti, I am the cause of, I am the siba, we'd say in modern Hebrew. I'm the reason or the cause, I'm the siba. So the text of Shmuel plays with the siba, with sovev and siba, and in fact, in this regard, it's interesting to see David and, and, Do, and Doe as kind of kindred spirits, both bound up, as it were, before God, Netzar with Nei Hashem, which is how this particular text is reading Doe. 
Doeg, according to the Agadah, and we'll perhaps get to this much later, is one of David's, one of the scholars, the Agadot in general take these characters and turn them into great scholars. Doeg being a great scholar and Doeg being a great teacher of Torah. And um, he's a sort of a, a righteous soul or a very talented soul who gets lost. And the cause of his being lost, and he was Netzar with Hashem, he was bound up before God. What happened to Doeg? So under the pressure of politics, pressure of the king, perhaps misunderstanding what's going on, he commits an act of murder which distances him from God forever. And therefore the blame, the Talmud assigns the blame not just to Doeg, Doeg is blamed plenty, but this particular text, David has to pay for this. How long do you think you get away without paying up for the crime that you committed? Through your actions, the city of No was the priests were massacred. Through your actions, knowing the Edomite was banished, took a good person, you caused him to stray, take responsibility. And Saul who dies, Saul who dies together with his sons, the same way the priests of No died. The chief priest and the and the others and the families, it's a kind of quid pro quo. God said to David, your arrival in Nov. And the, the translator adds this, you're misleading Abimelech. He lies to the priest. He misleads the priest. He pretends that he's on a secret mission. But in reality, he's running from Saul. Therefore, you must be punished. And now the Agada continues. None of this is in the text. But the Agada is using the text in a way. It's interesting always to see how. And it says, you may choose the punishment. You may choose the punishment. Is it your desire that your descendants will cease to exist or that you will be handed to the enemy? That's the choice that David is given. You can be handed over to your enemy and presumably killed by your enemy. Or if you wish, you can live, but your descendants will cease to exist. The house of David will not exist. That itself is interesting that God gives David a choice because actually we do find in the book of Samuel that David is given a choice at one point, choose your punishment. And that's precisely a couple of chapters later. That's chapter 24. That's the last chapter of Samuel where David is given three choices. One is a famine, one is a plague, and the third one is to run away from your enemy. And David in that story does not choose running away from your enemy. David hands it back to God, you choose. I don't want to be in the hand of another person. So here, David chooses. David says, master of the universe, it is preferable that I will be handed to the enemy and my descendants will not cease to exist. Fine. So David makes that choice. He's going to be handed over to the enemy. And now we have the following story. One day, David went to hunt with a falcon. That's the, the language here is not clear. That's the translation. It was scored by Bazai. It's a good question. Let's just take the translation. He went hunting. Satan came, Satan, and appeared to him as a deer. He shot an arrow at the deer, and the arrow did not uh, reach it. Satan led David to follow the deer until he reached the land of the Philistines. When Ishbi Benov saw David, he said, that is the person that killed my brother, Goliath. He bound him, doubled him over, placed him on the ground, and cast him under the beam of an olive press to crush him. So let's just stop here for a moment and think about this Agada. And that is, we have Satan coming. And Satan appears to him as a deer. And David has an arrow, and David shoots the arrow at the deer. But the, de but the arrow doesn't reach the deer. So David keeps chasing after the deer. And lo and behold, he ends up in the land of the Philistines. Just want to stop here for a moment and reflect upon this Agada. 
two things I find very interesting over here. First of all, Satan appearing as something and David shooting an arrow, we have already encountered that in the previous session. That's the story that the Talmud makes up about Bathsheba. Bathsheba was bathing behind the beehive, remember? And uh, Satan appeared in that story as a bird. And David shoots the arrow at the bird and he uh, hits the beehive, beehive breaks and Bathsheba is exposed behind the beehive. Here, once again, we have Satan, this time not as a, uh, not as a bird, but as a deer. And in this, once again, David shoots the arrow and, but the arrow doesn't reach him. And David keeps running after the deer and ends up in the land of the Philistines. So the parallel between the two was very interesting. And in particular, I had suggested about the first story that what the story about Bathsheba recalls is the story of the arrows with Jonathan. Remember that when David's running away from Saul, uh, he has a signal with Jonathan. Jonathan says, if my father's out to get you, I'll shoot the arrows and I'll tell the lad that's with me, go farther, go farther, run away, which is what happens. That's how Jonathan saves David in chapter 20. The next chapter is, and where does David run away to? To the city of priests. And when David leaves the city of priests with the sword of Goliath, where does David go? He goes to the Philistines. So the text over here is playing with that without question. But something else struck me as very interesting as far as the Talmud is concerned. That the Talmud has several agadot, famous ones, where someone would say, for example, Gira be'ene de Satan, an arrow in the eye of Satan. That's an expression we find in the Talmud, which means I'm able to overcome Satan. An arrow in the eye of Satan. And here you have Satan, Satan. And here you have the arrows. And here you have David shooting arrows and going farther and going farther. So it's playing off that very story. And where did David run to after the arrow episode? He runs to the city of Noah. So there's something very curious. And now he runs off and he finds himself in the land of the Philistines. Now in the book of Shmuel, it's important to remember that in the book of Shmuel, the Philistines are the main adversary, but the author of Samuel has conflated two different things. This is beyond our present capability of discussing it, very interesting. In the book of Shmuel, the Philistines are Philistines, but they're also giants. We should never forget that Goliath is the Philistine. He's also the giant. So David now, Yishbi Benov, okay? Suddenly, we have this entire story which is picking up on Nov, Yishbi Benov, that David will be destroyed by the Philistines or destroyed by the giants, one might say, a kind of reversal of the Goliath story because of the crime that he has committed. What is the crime he's committed? It's the crime of Nov. And just to reflect on this for a moment, because this is a theme that we have already encountered about the Talmudic view of David, which is connected to the Talmudic view of, of, of kingship, of people in power. And what the Talmud seems to be, what I say, obsessed with is the idea that the person in power must take responsibility for whatever happens, whether he does it himself directly or not, is less important. The important thing is, to set up the possibility of, of, of a crime taking place cannot exempt you from culpability, which is exactly the story over here. The whole point of the Gemara here, and we'll see this when we get to other Gemaras as well, is that the story of Nov, which when we read the story of Nov, it says, and, and Saul killed the, the priests of Nov, the men, the women, the children, and all the oxen, and all the animals, when you read that story about the massacre of Nob and Saul being the one to instigate it, you can't help but think about Amalek, because that's exactly what Saul doesn't do with, with Amalek. He spares the Amalekites. He doesn't kill the animals. He has compassion on the Amalekites, but he has no compassion on the priests of Nob. 
when you read it, that's immediately what, what you connected with, but that's not where this particular Gemara is going. They're not interested in Saul over here. On the contrary, it blames David for Saul's death. It blames David for Saul's punishment. So this is the story, Yishbi Benom. And now we have the following story. The following story. How the Gemara weaves these stories together was what is quite interesting. So now, meanwhile, the Yishbi Benov, this is the person that killed Goliath, my brother. By the way, when it lists chapter 21 of 2 Samuel, when it lists the four giants that David's men kill, they seem to be essentially, one is actually named Goliath, and they seem to be all Goliath figures, almost as if the book has taken the character of Goliath and split it into three pieces. Three of the four, basically Goliath, the descriptions of, 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 of Goliath. Here, he's the brother of Goliath. Ishbi ben is Goliath's brother. He's going to take vengeance for the death of his brother. So a miracle was performed for David. The earth opened up beneath him. He was not crushed by the beam. This is the meaning of that which is written in, in Tehillim. You have enlarged my steps that my feet did not slip. So that's um, piece earlier on the page. They don't line up the translation here with the Hebrew, unfortunately. Fine. So the Gemara relates the following story. That day, at dusk, on Shabbat Eve, so it was Friday night, Avishai ben Suya. Now, Avishai ben Suya is one of David's great warriors. He's the brother of Yoav ben Suya. David's commander-in-chief, and hopefully in a couple of weeks, we'll see a very famous Agadah about Yoav. It's an extremely interesting character. And he was shampooing his hair with four jugs of water in preparation for Shabbat. Shampooing his hair, we've seen that before. Who was shampooing hair last week? Haifa Reish, same language, Bathsheba. That's what Bathsheba was doing presumably in preparation for the possibility that her husband, Uriah, will return from battle. Which, in fact, he does return from battle, actually. So over here, it's Avishai ben Suya is preparing for Shabbos. He's taking a shower before Shabbos or whatever, shampooing his hair. He saw four bloodstains. There were those who say a dove came and fluttered its wings before him. Again, we have a bird. A dove came. Avishai said, the congregation of Israel is likened to a dove. As it says, you shall shine as the wings of a dove covered with silver. Right? Conclude from it that David, king of Israel, is in a state of distress. So Avishai sees this as a heavenly sign that David is in trouble. He, went, he goes to David's house and he can't find David. Avishai said, we learned in a Mishnah, one may not ride on the king's horse. One may not sit on his throne. One may not use his scepter. In a period of danger, what is the halacha? So Avishai, like all the other characters in the Talmud surrounding David, are very troubled by, you know, have a lot of halachic questions. So where does he go? He goes to the Beit Midrash, of course. He asks in the study hall, what is the ruling? They said, in a period of danger, Sakana, one may do so. So he mounts the king's mule. He rises and goes to the land of the Philistines. The land miraculously contracted for him. We have it with Sancheirev. The land contracts for him. He arrives quickly. As he was progressing, he saw Orpa. Orpa in the Medrash is the mother, is the name of the, of the giant's mother. We're familiar with Orpa from the book of Ruth. Here, Arpa is the, the great, the giantess, one might say. When she saw, she was spinning a thread. When she saw him, she removed her spindle and threw it at him, intending to kill him. Failing to do so, she said, young man, bring me my spindle. He threw the spindle at the top of her brain and killed her. When Ishbi Benov saw him, that's Avishai ben Suya, he said, now they are two, David and Avishai. They will kill me. He threw David up in the air. He stuck his spear into the ground. 
He said, let David fall upon it and die. Avishai recited a sacred name of God and suspended David between heaven and earth so he would not fall. We have this fantastic medrash here. The Gemara asks, let David himself recite the name of God. Why must Avishai recite the name of God? The Gemara answers, a prisoner does not release himself from prison. Uh, it requires someone else to release him. Rabbi Yochanan. So, now, before I'll stop you and take some comments and questions, this idea of David being suspended between heaven and earth. Who else is suspended in the book of Shmuel between heaven and earth? Anybody remember? Who was suspended between heaven and earth? Shmuel himself, when Shaul goes to the, the Balat Oath. No? That's not between heaven and earth. That's maybe between Shaul and earth. <laughs> I wouldn't call it saying suspended. Absolutely. It's described as actually being suspended between heaven and earth. Oh, Absalom. Absalom is being a Shemayim and being Yeah. And over here, it's interesting. So over here, and in that story, that's when Yoav, his general, kills Absalom. Mm. Suspended between heaven and earth. Here, it's Abisha, Yoav's brother, who will save David. But the point is, remember the story, the, in the beginning of the story, the question was, what do you prefer, to die yourself or to have no heirs to the throne? David says, I'd rather die myself and have heirs to the throne. And here it recalls the story of Absalom, who was the prospective heir of David, who doesn't succeed David. Over here, David himself is saved miraculously, but this allows, presumably, the fact that David was in danger, handed over to the enemy, is what allows David to have succession. Right. Let me stop here for a second, and if any other comments or questions, I'll take them. Um, is Orpa the mother? I thought it was Rafa who was the mother of the giants. Right, Yuide Rafa. So Rafa is from the word uh, Rifaim. Yeah. The Rifaim so are giants, so the Haggadah gives her a name. Gives her the name Arpa. Ah, same person. Okay. Arpa may be a place of Rifaim. Rifaim are giants. We they have Rafa. As I mentioned, the in the book of Shmuel, the Philistines who are the enemy are also the giants. I can digress two minutes, and if you wish, I can explain the, the significance of that. It's very significant for the book of Shmuel. It's not a point that most people have grasped, actually, but I'll explain it. What the significance is, the book of Shmuel is about the Philistines of the enemy. But what David does in the book of Shmuel, in the positive sense, David is the one who completes the conquest of the land of Israel, which is Jerusalem. The remaining piece of the land that's not been captured is Jerusalem, also called Yavuz. In the Torah, actually, the inhabitants of the land whom Israel will actually dispossess are two. One of whom uh, are the, are the are the Canaanites, that's one. But there's another group of people in the land that have to be dispossessed. And now those are the Rifaim, or the Anakim, or the Nephilim. When the scouts go into the land, remember they saw the Nephilim. And the Nephilim, the Canaanites are those who misbehave in the land, that's for sure. But the Rifaim, the Anakim, the Nephilim, these kind of prehistoric beings they are there, one might say, from the beginning of time. So that the conquest of the land is dispossessing not just Israel's prospective enemies, but actually God's enemies. The Nephilim, the Rephaim, the Anakim, the Zuzim, the Amim, the list goes on. And that's very important. So the author of Samuel understood this. And therefore, he combines the Philistines, actually, are combined together with the, with the Rephaim. In fact, when David captures Jerusalem and then the Philistines hear about it and David defeats the Philistines, where does David defeat the Philistines? My old haunting ground, Amik Rephaim. Amik Rephaim is where he did. So the, 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 the text has actually conflated the Rephaim and, and the Christian. So here, in any event, over here, we have this giant, she's a giant, he's a giant, Ishbi Beno. So the text conflates the two. 
And the text has David being saved. David can't save himself. That's the point. Can't save himself. David is going to be saved by one of his uh, one of his uh, strong men, one might say, Yoav's brother, Avishai ben Surya. Okay, let's just let's, let's get back. Anybody else for a comment or question? There was one question that was asked yes. a little bit earlier. Yeah. Uh, Ruth had asked, what is the significance of Doeg's name? What was he actually worried about? Yeah, well, I would say Doeg is the Gemara talks about, but Doeg is with Ogis is, is to worry. So in the story, what Saul had said to his people, nobody cares about me, nobody worries about me. And Doeg is represented in the one is, who cares about Saul. He's the one who when Saul says, no one cares about me, my own son conspires against me, et cetera, et cetera. And no one has pity on me, no one has mercy on me. So presumably Doeg, the one who is Doeg, who cares for Saul, that's how he represents himself in the story, either to come in favor with Saul or out of pity for Saul, or maybe out of genuine concern for Saul, it's very hard to know, but he's the one who testifies against the priests of Noah. Uh, so Doeg means the one who worries, the one who cares. Yeah. Okay, let us, let's get back to the text now. And time is running out, and we'll, let's uh, get back there. So fine. Well, let's just go back a little more. So uh, fine. So Avishai said to David, what do you seek here? Why do you fall into his hands? So David says to him, this is what God said to me. This is what I responded. I, was, I said... I'd rather put myself in jeopardy than put my descendants in jeopardy. Avishai said to him, reverse your prayer. Reverse your prayer. Pray for yourself and let your descendants take care of themselves. There's an expression, let your son's sons be a poor peddler, sell wax, and you will not suffer. Fine, let's continue a little further down. So it says, he quotes the verse in, in Shmuel, that Avishai came to David's aid. This means, says Rabbi Udara, he came to his aid in prayer. He recited another sacred name and David has a soft landing. He ran safely, having been suspended between heaven and earth. Let's move further down. Um, further down. Um, fine, let's see now. Right. It's after this it is written, then David's men took an oath to him saying, you shall not go with us to war anymore and you will not douse the lamp of Israel. Now let's skip a little further down and there's one more Gemara I wanted to get to and then we can discuss this. From where do we derive that David's descendants cease to exist? Because we said that David reverses his prayer. As it is stated, and Atalia, the mother of Ahaziah, saw that her son was dead. She arose and destroyed all the royal descendants. Atalia is the uh, sister, I believe, of Ahab, connected to Ahab. And she, the mother of Ahaziah, there's a connection to Ahab there. When her son dies, she kills all the other descendants, all the children, and she takes over. So we see in that story, it says that the house of David has been destroyed. So the Gemara asks, but didn't Yoash remain alive? It was one son who actually survives, Yoash, who then becomes the next king, and Atalia is then executed. So what do you mean they all died? The house of David didn't die completely. Atalia massacred all of David's descendants, but one, but one existed. The Gemara says, there too, in the massacre in Nov, Evyatar, one of the priests, remained alive as it is written, and one of the sons of Achimelech, son of Achituv, named Eviatar, escaped. Rav Yehuda says in the name of Rav, were it not for the fact that Eviatar remained alive for Achimelech, the son of Achituv, there would have been no remnant or refugee remaining from the, from the descendants of David. So that last statement is something to think about, the degree to which the Gemara is taking seriously David's complicity in the murder of the priests of Noah to the extent that actually the fact that Atalia, who massacres all of 
the children uh, and then takes over the throne herself. But one son is hidden. There's one son who hides out, Yoash, who is kept alive, and then they make him the king. But that's only because in the massacre of Nov, there was one, one child who remains alive, which is Abiatar, David's prospective priest. If not for that, then David's descendants would have been completely destroyed and wiped out as punishment for Nov, for the murder of Nov, which is blamed on David, for the banishment of Doeg, blamed on David, and uh, for the fact that Saul himself is punished, is also blamed on David. So let's just review here what we have in this. I find this a very interesting Agadah. Because it takes three different stories, actually. And it plays with the three stories. It, the, the connecting point is Nov. Od hayom v'nov l'amod. Why is it that Talmud asks that he stops at Nov? Why does Sancherev stopping at Nov? You know, it's funny. Because the way the Talmud tells the story, he has what's called kfitza taderech. He gets to Jerusalem very, very quickly. There's a miracle and he rushes to get to Jerusalem. But when he gets to Jerusalem, he waits too long. The timing is everything. So he waits too long and he, he's, but he stops in Nov first. Why does he stop in Nov? Says the Talmud, because the city of Nov is the justification for, for, for destroying the temple and killing the priests. So he stops at Nov. That's how it begins. And then the Talmud, the next step is, and who is the guilty party at Nov? Not what you expect. Anybody who reads the book of Samuel says that's Saul's great crime, failure to kill Amalek, but massacring the priests of Nov. The Gemara never is suggesting, in my view, that's not the case. The Gemara knows very well that anybody who reads the story that the blame is put on Saul. That's for sure. It doesn't mean to say that Saul is not guilty, but it's saying something additional, saying that Saul is guilty, yes, but there's an additional culprit in the story and the Gemara chooses to focus on David much more than Saul. The Saul's an obvious, Saul's obviously guilty, but those that allow it to happen or, or actually enable it, could have known better, should have known better, and in this sense, it's very striking that Doe, who is a, one of the characters of the chapter, he loses his share in the world to come. But the way that Talmud presents Doe, he's a kind of righteous person who could have, a righteous person and a great scholar, who could have been a very significant religious personality. But David, David puts Doe in a place where he is tempted to do the wrong thing. And Doe cannot withstand the temptation and is complicit in the murder of the priests of Nov. So that's, so we start with Od Hayom Benov Lamod, which is coming out of the whole story of the Assyrians and Sancherev and Chizkiyahu. And then you move to the story of the massacre of the priests. And then we have the third story interwoven with the first two, Ishbi Benov. And there you have a text which says very little. It was Ishbi Benov. And actually, let me read you from chapter 21 in Shmuel what it says about Ishbi Benov. And um, is it on the handout? It's somewhere in the handout as well. I'll just read it to its very brief. Um, it says, there was a war against the Philistines, chapter 21, verse 15 of 2 Samuel. And David became tired. And David a giant intended to kill David. David 
לא תצא עוד איתנו למלחמה ולא תכבה את בני ישראל. At that point, the generals, the David soldiers said, they took an oath saying to David, we don't want you to fight anymore, lest the candle, the flame of Israel, of Israel be, be extinguished. That's what it says over here. So David's in a war, he gets tired. Avishai ben Suya helps him. And then they say to David, don't fight anymore. So the Haggadic reading of it is, he, he, he helped him in prayer. Uh, this is happening to David as a punishment, which is not at all in the story. The punishment being the story of no. Do not, uh, we don't want you to be killed and the candle of Israel should not be extinguished, which the Agada takes to mean, don't worry about the future so much, worry about yourself. You made a mistake in saying, let me be handed over as long as my descendants live. Let the descendants worry about themselves, says Abishai. It's important that you live. So that can be seen as a reading of this particular text. But to come back to our, just to conclude with the thought about the, where this is all headed. Um, it takes us back, I think, to what I believe is one of the central themes in the Bavli about kingship, about people in power in general, and the extent that people in power uh, have the responsibility they have to make sure that that bad things don't happen under their watch. And the story of Nov actually is a story that when you read the book of Shmuel, you don't necessarily focus on David at all. But the Bavli here in Sanhedrin does focus on David. And next week, we will see something even more interesting about Nov. And there, which is a Gemara in Yuvamot, which is the next hand, next next piece on the page, uh, we'll see this next week, that the Gemara has a very interesting uh, Agadic reading of the book of Shmuel. But it's such an interesting reading because when you finish reading it, you say to yourself, is this an Agadic reading? Or is this a flat out interpretation, what we call pshat? Because I believe it's actually the pshat. It's very hard to know sometimes. But I think the point of the agada is not that there's not an interpretive element, but in studying agada, I think you're looking for the message. And the messages that we will see in these various agada was sort of is you don't want to reduce the Bavli to one or two messages. We don't want to suggest that every agadic text agrees with the next, because the Bavli has many voices. But when you read a bunch of these agada, certain things come through loud and clear. We saw this with David and Bathsheba, which is all about protesting. The Sugi is about protesting evil or not allowing evil to take place under your watch and the responsibility that you incur for that. Whether you technically sinned or not is irrelevant, but it happened because of you. Um, and there's Gemara over here about Nov. So I think next week we will continue with Nov with the next, next segment of the Bavli which is the sugi in, in Masechet Yevramot, which talks about Nov in an extremely interesting way, one that is not obvious at all in the book of Shmuel. But after you read the Gemara, it actually could be what the book of Samuel is after. So let me just stop here. If anybody has a comment uh, now, we can try, I'll try to address it, and then we'll stop and find out who won, who won the election. I thought you asked something about Doeg. Um, yes. Because you're saying it, uh, in the last text that he could have been a very holy man. Yes. And yet, unlike Yonatan, who tries to stop his father from some of his misdeeds, you never see, at least in the book of Shmuel, Doeg trying to stop Shmuel from killing the Kohanim or whatever. You never see that part of him. True, that is true. On the other hand, when, when, when Saul says to his men, kill the priest, nobody lifts a finger to kill the priest, including Doeg. Ah. It's only when Saul turns to Doeg and says, you do it, because you testified against them, then Doeg does it. Okay. So the book of, I'm not suggesting that, there's something else about Doeg that's very interesting. I, see, I don't believe in general 
that that these characters are, are, are I mean, the main characters are never black and white. What's interesting about the Agada is that they, even the minor characters are not black and white. But there is something inter- interesting about Doeg or Adomi. Adomi, Edom. Edom is Esav. Esav is a killer. Esav is the sword. David is Admoni. He's red. He also walks around with 400 men in the book of Samuel. We saw last week that the 400 men in the, in the Talmud Bavli are the 400 children of uh, Yifat Toar, which is another. But there's something else, and I'll just end with the following thought about David and Doeg and the commonalities. There's something about the shepherd who's a killer, which is what David is. David is ruthless towards his enemies. He is ruthless. It's true that if David has a way to solve his problem without killing, he doesn't kill. He doesn't, he doesn't initially want to kill Uriah. He sends him home. But if that doesn't work, he's perfectly capable of, of, of slitting your throat. He is a killer. Now, he directs his energies mostly to killing off Israel's enemies. But there's a ruthless side to David. At the same time, he's a shepherd. He's a singer. He's an actor. He's a poet. And there's something about the combination, which is perhaps shocking to some extent. And doeg ha'adomi abir ha'roim ha'shel v'sha'ul the chief shepherd of Saul, who turns out to be the chief murderer of Saul. So there's something about that, I think, that in the book of Shmuel, at least, there's something about that which is very interesting. It's certainly true that the book of Shmuel makes no attempt on any level to gloss things over or to necessarily present people in the the best light, and neither does the Talmud Bavli. On the other hand, as we will see, there's another side to David, which is, which is seen as terrific in the, in, in the Book of Shmuel as well, and certainly in the Bavli. So but my point being that the Bavli picks up on, I think, really the character of David as described primarily in the Book of Samuel. But of course, it brings in other texts as well. We'll bring in the Psalms, we'll bring in Chronicles, etc. So next week, we will continue with the Sugi in Masechet Yevamot, which is on the, the handout. And that should be extremely interesting. Okay, thank, thank you, you very so much. much. Rabbi Silbert, do yes. you have um, a moment for one quick comment and another yes. question that we're posting yes. in the chat? Go ahead. So Jonathan wrote that it seems like the Bavli is uncomfortable with David's disassembling, dis, I'm sorry, dissembling and deception in no, like Jacob's behavior several times. Well, there's certainly the case that, look, he lies to the priest. And in lying to the priest, he gets the priest and his family killed. So the Bavli picks up on what is obvious. Now you could say that, and the, the worst of it is he knows that Doeg is there. He says it himself. We don't have to condemn David. It's unnecessary. He condemns himself. And he says it straight out. Anochi Saboti. I am the cause of the death of your family. David said it himself, which is a shocker when you read it because we have no inkling that it's true till the end of the story. Until David says it, we don't know that David knows that Doeg is there. That's what David says. So it's not what it's not about us sitting in judgment. It's not our job to sit in judgment of anyone. Our job is to try to figure out what the book is saying. Then we can think about it afterwards. You know, it's always about what is this text saying? Then we can ask another question. How do I respond to that? But the first step is to see what it says. You know, so that's uh, that's the goal here. And I think that's essentially one of the goals of the Bavli, but the Bavli has an interest here in teaching us about, about behavior, about responsibility, about leadership and all that. So I think that's where the Bavli is taking it. But that's the, the, the Bavli's voice in these stories and the book of Shmuel's voice in these stories, I read them as being very similar, basically on the same wavelengths here. It's not two different wavelengths. Okay, I'll stop here then and thank you again. There's one one more quick one yeah, more question, which I'm not sure if it's gonna be a quick one, but maybe uh, why is David being depicted in such negative stories? Is that a question about the Bavli or about the Book of Shmuel? I'm gonna go with probably both. <laughs> why? Because the Book of Shmuel is the Book of Shmuel presents a, a nuanced picture of David. Because the Book of Shmuel, among other things, and the Bavli, are concerned about power, as Samuel himself was. Samuel was against kingship. 
because the king inevitably will see himself as God. That's what Samuel said. Um, human history does not suggest that Samuel was wrong. Neither does the Bible suggest that he's wrong. God does not say to Samuel they can't have a king. God says the opposite. Give them a king, warn them about kingship. So one can read one aspect of the book of Shmuel is, a, is essentially a warning about power. How power can corrupt people, how those who seek power may be corrupt to begin with. And the desire to hold on to power at all costs is very, very dangerous. Uh, so that is what the book's about. You know, the question always is, what is the book about? The author of Samuel has zero interest in presenting a rosy picture of David. It has a different agenda. That's not to say that David at points in the book of Samuel is not a great hero. In my view, he is a great hero. And he's also able to accept responsibility, which I think is what's central to the book. People make mistakes, leaders make mistakes. Can they say, I'm not gonna do it again. It was my fault, whatever. That is in the book of Shmuel. But what makes the book of Shmuel a great book actually is, you know, it's a great book because it's people are very complicated and there were no constraints in the book. It's a book in which the, 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 the medium of Endor, the Balat O, is actually a hero. In the Torah, the O is the ultimate idolater. Ov and Yidoni, together with Moach, is the main of the Zorah of the Torah. In the book of Samuel, she's a hero. So it's a writer who has, who has no constraints. And we have, when you have no constraints, you can often get to, to a very deep truth. So we'll see this again in our study. Next week should be very interesting. The Gemara and Yuvamo, I find that extremely interesting as an interpretive uh, piece. Okay, I will stop at this point and uh, look forward to seeing you next week as well. Thank you all. all right, thank you so much, Rabbi Silver. And thank you everybody for joining us tonight on Zoom and on Drusha Live and on Facebook. Uh, don't miss out on our other fall classes. We continue tomorrow night for, with, at 8 p.m. with Miriam Gedweiser for a class titled Husbands, Wives, and Human Dignity in the Talmud. We expect it to be another interesting and uh, insightful conversation about relationships, and I do hope you'll join us. Check out our website for all the details for, for all the website links, www.jerisha.org forward slash classes. Have a wonderful rest of your night, everyone, and take care. Be well. Thank, Thank you. you. That was fantastic.